Before we continue, I'd just like to give a shout out to the sponsor of this video. NI Classic Shirt Co. is an independent, classic, football apparel retailer based in Northern Ireland. They have a shop in Newtownards, County Down, and the website has hundreds of shirts available to buy with worldwide shipping. Click the links in the description below and enjoy browsing their incredible collection. This discount code on screen will get 10% off orders over £50, but make sure to be quick as there are only 10 coupons available. Now let's get back to talking about AC Milan in the 2000s. In the mid to late 90s, AC Milan was struggling to find stability. Silvio Berlusconi failed to find appropriate replacements for Saki and Capello and wound up recalling them, which ended in 11th and 10th place finishes between 1996 and 98. The retirement of key figures like Franco Baresi and Mauro Tassotti left gaps in the squad that could not be filled, and they suffered far too many goals. Excluded from European football, these were desperate times for the Rossonieri, and the appointment of former Udinese manager Alberto Zaccaroni didn't inspire much confidence. With him, he brought an unconventional 3-4-3 system, and the Serie A's top scorer Oliver Bierhoff, who formed a fruitful offensive line with George Weyer. Steadied by a more balanced defence, Milan were able to clinch their 16th Serie A title in 1999. A young goal-scoring star was emerging from Ukraine and was met with great demand after a few marvellous years in Kiev as Dynamo's number 10. The Milanese club won the race for the 23-year-old, acquiring him for the then record transfer fee of 25 million euros. And with the Liberian's London departure in the new year of 2000, Andrei Shevchenko became the focal point of the attack. Gennaro Gattuso was also brought to the fashion capital at this time, an aggressive defensive midfielder who had a tireless work rate and versatility in the centre of the field that helped reinforce an ageing midfield. The number eight quickly became a fan favourite and earned the nickname Reno Gattuso for his wild temperament and passion on the pitch. Their new signings had settled well, particularly Shevchenko, who with 24 league goals had become the Serie A's top scorer in his debut Italian season, but the club were unable to lift any further trophies by the spring of 2001. The loyal captain of the Rossonieri, Paolo Maldini, had taken the armband at a difficult time and struggled to lead his beloved side to the success seen a decade prior, especially in the Champions League. His father Cesare was appointed assistant manager at the time of Zaccaroni's dismissal in March, but couldn't rescue them and Milan finished 6th. In November 2001, off the back of a similarly lacklustre run of form, Carlo Ancelotti, a former Milanista and teammate of Maldini, Costacurta and Rossi, was selected by Berlusconi as his side's new head coach. A summer of heavy spending had preceded Ancelotti's return, including the club's most expensive ever signing, Rui Costa for €43 million, Euros, as well as Andrea Pirlo and Filippo Inzaghi. In his first year, Ancelotti set up the side in a way that prompted criticism from certain supporters and Berlusconi himself, who labelled the manager's tactics overly defensive, and he responded with an attempt to add a creative flair to the side. It was under Ancelotti that Pirlo completely altered his game, moving from an attacking role to a deep-lying playmaker or regista. Here, Pirlo's composure and vision elevated him to a world-class midfielder helping the team click in the grey area between defence and attack. Further odd choices followed, such as the promotion of Dida from the bench to a regular starter. The 28-year-old was clearly capable, but notoriously had an error in him, and questions over Angelotti's selection persisted. Ahead of Andrea sat Rui Costa in the number 10 role that he had excelled in with Fiorentina throughout the 90s. The Portuguese Trey Cortista provided for the clinical attacking duo of Shevchenko and Inzaghi, whose hunger for goals made them more and more lethal in the face of goal as the season progressed. However, it wasn't until the 2002-03 campaign that the side felt primed to compete. Four-time Serie A Defender of the Year Alessandro Nesta joined the Rossonieri in the summer window, significantly fortifying an already impressive defence. Cross-city rivals Internazionale 
surrendered their young Dutch midfielder Clarence Seedorf, a two-time European champion who had a very well-rounded game and possessed incredible physical attributes, especially stamina and strength. The likes of Rivaldo and John Dahl Thomason were also introduced to the squad as quality reserves for the attacking players. Angelotti opted for a 4-1-2-1-2 diamond formation with Pirlo sat at the base of midfield with Seidorf and Gattuso either side patrolling the wide spaces and closing down opponents to afford time to the maestro. Nesta and Maldini instantly connected in the defensive line and became one of Europe's most resilient partnerships. Both were quick, intelligent and tough, able to read opponents effectively and nullify their attacks, timing tackles perfectly and leading from the back. Though much improved, Milan were unable to match Juventus's league form, but managed a third place Serie A finish, their best in three years. However, it was in the Champions League that Angelotti's side shone, topping both group stages with impressive triumphs over Real Madrid and Bayern Munich. Inzaghi in particular excelled, netting nine goals in nine group games, including a hat-trick versus Deportivo La Coruña. Ronald Koeman's youthful Ajax side, which starred a soaring Zlatan Ibrahimovic, posed great threat to the Italians and held them to a goalless first leg in Amsterdam. The return fixture was the polar opposite. Milan's number nine stole the advantage. But the Dutch response left the game at 2 all with five minutes left to play. Ajax would have been semi-finalists if it weren't for Thomason's 91st minute winner, which sent the five-time European champions through to face Inter in the next round. A nil-nil draw as hosts in the first leg put the Nerazzurri in the driving seat for the second, but Shevchenko's crucial away goal was sufficient to make Milan finalists for the first time since 1995. A week before the conclusion of their European journey, Angelotti's team had to play another final, the Coppa Italia versus Roma, but the Gilarossi couldn't match their quality or work rate and underwent a humiliating 4-1 defeat at the Stadio Olimpico. On the 28th of May 2003, Milan met the domestic champions Juventus in the first ever All-Italian Champions League final. Marcello Lippi's 11 was aggressive and physically assertive, while also featuring an assortment of world-class talent. Many predicted the match to be a bore, as both groups were defensively astute, and though there were some exciting chances throughout, the 120 minutes in Manchester were ultimately unriveting. Individual moments of defensive brilliance had restricted any goals after extra time, leading to spot kicks which were also rather dire. Of the first seven, only two were converted, and after Montero's miss, Nesta stepped up to plunder the lead. Well, they have to score Juventus now. The skipper for the old lady levelled the tally at 2 all, yet the Ukrainian number 7 approached Buffon with the chance to reclaim the advantage for victory. With his side-footed pass to the bottom right, he etched his name into Rossonieri history as Milan were crowned champions of Europe. Tonight it's Paolo's prize, it's Milan's night in Manchester. The triumph was especially sweet for Ancelotti as he had been harshly sacked by Juventus due to his silverware shortcomings, which had urged him back to the fashion capital. Man of the match Paolo Maldini enjoyed a historical family moment with their win. Exactly 40 years prior, his father Cesare lifted Milan's first ever European title at Wembley, and now his son was able to do so at Old Trafford with the very same club. It was notably special for Seydorf also, who became the first player in history to win the Champions League with three different clubs, previously with Ajax in 1995 and Real Madrid in 2000. Having endured a four-year trophyless stretch, Milan had suddenly discovered major success under Angelotti, who Berlusconi therefore allowed to fully complete his side, fit to win a Scudetto. With this boost of trust from the businessman, he looked to Brazil for reinforcement, and found Kaka, a 21-year-old attacking midfielder from Sao Paulo. Convinced by his pace and natural skill, Angelotti signed him for 8 million euros. Now 37, 
Costa Curta was no longer able to endlessly patrol the right flank, and the Selesau captain Cafu was brought from Roma to occupy Milan's right back position after rejecting a move to Japan. A standout feature of Il Pendolino, the express train as he was christened in the capital, was his unrivaled stamina and crossing ability, which added a completely new dimension to the Rossonieri attack. The fullback saw his first game time off the bench in Milan's 2003 UEFA Super Cup victory over Porto, which kickstarted an impressive year. Within just a month of his arrival, Kaka had displaced Rui Costa's role in the starting eleven, impressing everyone with his on-ball technique and ability to link up with the team so fluidly. His electric pace was a major boost in the attack, and with Cafu's sprints down the wing, Milan became far more dangerous on the break. Their defensive resilience kept them unbeaten until December, only conceding six goals in four months and topping the table. In this run, Shevchenko had been the standout, averaging a goal a game with 12 from 12 matches and stepping up while Inzaghi was out the squad. With the relationships in midfield further developed, the quartet was working brilliantly, and overall, this period is considered the peak of Angelotti's side. Across the whole 11 were world-class players in their prime, and as the season continued past the winter, Milan became uncatchable. Beating runners-up Roma in May guaranteed them the Scudetto before the season's final game, with an Italian record of 82 points from 34 games. This was Ancelotti's first domestic league title, edging out the Romans by 11 points, but they suffered some shock shortcomings. Losses in the Club World Cup to Boca Juniors, the Supercoppa Italiana to Juventus, but their most unexpected and humiliating moment came in the Champions League versus Deportivo La Coruña. The champions hosted the first leg of the quarter-final, and as expected, were dominant, giving a masterclass 4-1 performance at the San Siro to cement a spot in the semis. However, in A Coruña, the confident Italians were stunned, unable to create clear-cut chances and defensively were vulnerable. Unable to respond to the four Spanish goals, Milan were sent home, humbled by the underdogs. For the summer transfer window, Ancelotti had minimal demands, knowing his side is as he wants it, yet if they aim to retain the Scudetto, they would need another world-class defender with relevant experience. This gap was aptly filled by Lazio's Dutch powerhouse Jap Stam, a 6'2", 31-year-old former European champion, completing perhaps the fiercest back four of its time. From Chelsea, Loney Hernan Crespo also joined the squad. Previously enjoying successful seasons with three other Italian clubs, the Argentine was a proven marksman and a perfect fit for Ancelotti's system. The title holders began the season auspiciously. After a superb year as the league's top scorer, Shevchenko's exceptional hat-trick versus Lazio won Milan the Supercoppa, and already the Rossonieri seemed raring to embark on a triumphant year. Within the first half of the season, they were again exceptional, and in tight contest with Juventus, for the spot at the table's peak. Kaka and Shevchenko gelled together like never before, and were unplayable at times with the pacey Brazilian providing for the number 7, whose goal-scoring numbers were unprecedented. Dominant in the air and difficult to mark due to his elite understanding of timing and movement, the Ukrainian was amongst the greatest finishers in the world's game at the time, and in December he was voted by FIFA as the winner of the Ballon d'Or. March saw the holders lead the league above the old lady, but into April they dropped five points to Brescia and Siena to help the Bianconeri back into the running. Following three comfortable victories to see out the month, they hosted Juve, a game that would ultimately determine the champions. David Trezeguet buried Del Piero's acrobatic cross and held their lead for the duration, reclaiming the advantage in the title race. Needing Capello's side to drop points in their remaining three matches, Milan had lost hope and surrendered the top spot after three consecutive draws, widening the gap between first and second. The Turin club had the best defence and attack in the league, conceding the fewest goals 
and outscoring the other 19 teams. They were undoubtedly the most robust and well-organised side in Italy, and across 38 matches were better than the Rossoneri. Yet, Ancelotti's team were more successful in a different competition. Seen as one of the favourites in the Champions League, Milan looked to avenge their Deportivo nightmare and began perfectly, topping their group of a Frank Rijkaard intimidating Barcelona. <laughs> their round of 16 tie drew them with Manchester United, which made for a couple of tense matches home and away. Ancelotti's new signing proved to be worth his salt, as Hernan Crespo netted the only two goals, one at Old Trafford and one at the San Siro, advancing them into a familiar quarter-final with Inter. As the home side, Milan secured the lead in the tie after a Stam header and Shevchenko stunner, and within a week, the northern rivals met for the second leg. Contentious as expected, three bookings were made within 11 minutes, but tensions compounded at the time of Shevchenko's 30th minute opener, leaving Mancini's side desperate, needing four goals to advance. Eventually, the Nerazzurri found their first on the road to an epic comeback, with a 71st minute corner nodded in by Esteban Cambiasso. The referee, however, found issue with the Argentines' challenge for the header and disallowed the goal, sending 60,000 Inter fans in uproar. As Dida readied himself for the free kick, the wall of black and blue behind him started throwing flares down at the Brazilian, one of which hit him on the back of the head. Oi, 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 it's all. This just exacerbated things, and before long, a barrier of red mist blocked off the Milan goal, generating one of the sport's most memorable images. Out of control and unclearable, the match was abandoned, and UEFA awarded the Rossinieri a 3-0 victory, placing them in the semis. Gus Hiddink's PSV offered little challenge at the San Siro, suffering a 2-0 defeat in the fashion capital, before hosting the Italians for the second leg. Buren stunned Ancelotti's side, who found themselves deadlocked with the Dutch on aggregate. With Pirlo marked out of the game by the vigorous Park Ji Sung, Milan were creatively trapped, unable to build attacks or withhold the PSV assault. As the clock edged towards 90, Kaka uncovered space to cross for an unmarked Massimo Ambrosini, who converted the decisive header. Though they had won to reach another European final, the 3-1 loss on the night was telling of Milan's frailties when comfortably ahead against a weaker team. The 2005 final was to be played at the Ataturk Olympic Stadium in Istanbul, and Milan's opponent was Rafa Benitez's Liverpool. The Reds were certainly a lesser side, fielding an 11 mainly full of average players, while the Italian champions had a world-class player in every position. The best defensive unit in the world? one of the strongest midfields around, and the best player on the planet. Despite this, Liverpool's road to the final had seen them surprisingly overcome both Juventus and Chelsea, the champions of Italy and England. As the final started though, the disparity between the sides became obvious. Kaka's early trickery fooled Traore for a free kick, and Pirlo's delivery was volleyed home by their 36-year-old skipper, who stole the opener after just 50 seconds the fastest goal in a Champions League final as of 2021. From here, the Italians were dominant. Their midfield quartet overwhelmed the duo of Gerard and Xabi Alonso, who essentially chased their shadows for the first 45 minutes. The Brazilians' direct runs at Hippia and Carragher, while the pair tried to mark the strikers, were unbearable, and quickly things went from bad to worse for the Scousers. On the counter, the offensive trio divided to free space for the Argentines' simple tap-in. Then, Kaka spun the English captain and exquisitely picked out the number 11 with a 40-yard pass, which the marksman stabbed over Jersey Dudek for 3-0. Ancelotti's plan had worked perfectly, leaving Liverpool all but beaten by the time of the first half whistle. Liverpool returned in a different formation, with more men in midfield aiming to tighten up the centre of the park and allow less freedom for Pirlo and Kaka. What followed into the second half is simply one of the most incredible moments in football history. In a six-minute spell, Liverpool levelled the scoreline with three goals, a header from Gerrard, a long shot from Smyser, 
and a penalty from Alonso. Whether it was down to Merseyside spirit or a lapse in concentration, this fantastic Milan side had relinquished their 3-0 lead during the most important game of their year. Some heroic Liverpool defensive work denied the Italians, and neither team managed to find the back of the net, resulting in a shootout to decide the championship. From 12 yards, the surprises continued. Serginho and Pirlo, one of the most assured takers, both missed while the Liverpudlians got ahead. At 3-1 to Liverpool, the Ballon d'Or winner approached the spot to salvage hope, but the Polish number one rejected his shot and put to bed the miracle of Istanbul. Arguably the most remarkable turnaround ever, Gerard had dragged the Reds back to European glory after 30 years, but the emotional drop from delight to despair left Milan dumbstruck, having to pin what happened on fate, knowing that while Liverpool's talisman lifted the trophy, it should have been theirs. A season with so much promise had crumbled. The aim of retaining the title wasn't achieved, and European dreams narrowly escaped them, but the football Milan were playing was top draw, brutally outscoring opponents and riveting fans with aggressive, forward-thinking play. Haunted by the summer, the Istanbul Syndrome, as Pirlo later named it, somewhat bled into their 2005-06 season. On a search for the title, Ancelotti managed to almost completely hold on to their full team and add to the squad's feebler areas. Still enthralling to watch across all competitions, the likes of Kaka, Shevchenko and newcomer Alberto Gilardino were the finest performers. The Ukrainian finished the year as their top scorer for the third consecutive campaign. Despite winning more frequently and reducing their rate of tying, their six losses in the Serie A rendered them second best to the ever-consistent Juventus. Vengeful, they were dominant in Europe, summiting their group before overcoming Bayern Munich 5-2 on aggregate and Lyon 3-1. This earned them a final four spot, drawing the Catalans in an unpredictable tie that was kicked off at the San Siro. There was no apparent gap in quality between the sides, but one moment of excellence from the 2005 Player of the Year separated them, and Barcelona hosted the Italians with a precious away goal. Needing two goals to continue, Ancelotti's team failed to break down the Spaniards, who went on to lift the trophy, denying Milan's retribution. The old lady's reign as champions didn't last long. In July 2006, Juventus were stripped of two titles and demoted into the Serie B for their role in a refereeing scandal named Calciopoli. Milan were also at the centre of the scandal, but received a lesser sentence and the Italian Football Federation chose to deduct 30 points from their 2005-06 tally. With this punishment, they finished in third place and therefore had to compete in the third qualifying round for the Champions League. After seven years in the fashion capital, Andrei Shevchenko was sold to Chelsea for 40 million euros, departing Milan as one of the club's most prolific ever goalscorers. This was obviously a huge loss for the team and signalled the beginning of the end for Ancelotti's side. Ronaldo El Fenomeno was added to the team, but his game time was scarce as he was out of shape, therefore leaving Gilardino and the aging Inzaghi to lead the lines for the 2006-07 campaign. Inzaghi! Starting the Serie A with an eight-point penalty hurt Milan, who weren't as strong as before. At the end of September, they went on a miserable run of form, only clinching one win in nine matches, which essentially ruined their championship hopes. The squad's poor displays in the fall were pinned on their physical condition, and into the new year of 2007, Ancelotti arranged a retreat in Malta to recover their fitness for the latter half of the season. It proved beneficial for the Rossoneri, maintaining an unbeaten run from November to March. Considering the lack of fully fit strikers, Ancelotti opted for a 4-3-2-1 Christmas tree setup, pushing Sadov into a more offensive role next to Kaka 
who was given absolute creative freedom as the talisman of the side. The fullbacks Massimo Oddo and Marek Jankolowski acted as wingbacks on the attack, providing the missing width for crossing into the centre forward. However, two points from four games in May allowed Lazio to slip ahead into third place as the league race was concluded. In August, Super Pippo's brace versus Red Star Belgrade had done enough to qualify them for the Champions League, and in the next stage the Italians conquered a rather easy group to again finish first. Their Brazilian 22 was pivotal, saving them with an away winner in Belgium and a winning hat-trick as Anderlecht's hosts. Versus Celtic, Kaka was again the man of the moment, netting an exceptional individual goal to bypass a tough Celtic side in the round of 16. Ready. Van Boyten's 93rd minute equaliser at the San Siro gave Bayern the edge in the tie, but a brilliant performance in Germany by Seydorf eased Milan into the semis to face Manchester United, a side that knew them well. In one of the games of the competition, Kaka enjoyed his finest match in a black and red shirt, responding to United's opener with a narrow left-footed finish. Then, he robbed the lead by physically outdoing Darren Fletcher, skillfully tricking Evra and Aitza prior to slotting away his best career goal past van der Sar. Absolutely magical. He was the greatest player on the planet at the time, with the unique ability to change a game on his own, and though Milan went on to lose the first leg at Old Trafford, the Brazilian had given the Italians a real chance in the tie. Under heavy rainfall at the San Siro, Ancelotti's Milan pressed Ferguson United, giving them no time to breathe, and within 11 minutes, their playmaker gave them the lead. Seydorf doubled the advantage from distance, killing Mancunian hopes, and a late finish by Gilardino added insult to injury. The Rossoneri reached their third European final in five years, and following their shootout against Chelsea, Liverpool would again be their opponent. Unlike two years prior, the sides were well matched. Liverpool had generally improved their starting eleven, while Milan fielded the oldest team ever in a Champions League final, with an average age at just over 31 years. Selected for Ancelotti's roster was Inzaghi. The 33-year-old was on a path to retirement, and hadn't been the best striker at the club that year, so his inclusion was a surprise for many. Held this time at the Olympic Stadium of Athens, the Italians in their lucky white strip were transfixed by the thought of revenge, but their start to the game wasn't ideal. After a few fruitless scout attacks, Kaka won a free kick in a dangerous position for the architect. As Pirlo struck the ball, Inzaghi peeled off the wall and into the path of his shot, wrong-footing Pepe Reina right before the end of the half. Into the second 45, Liverpool again pressed the Italians, looking for the equaliser, but Milan's defence held on. The Reds had more possession, shots and corners in this half, while Ancelotti's side were more reserved on the ball, comfortable with soaking up pressure. Ten minutes remained, and Ambrosini found Kaka unmarked in open space, until almost telepathically he fed the number nine's perfectly timed run. With the memory of Istanbul fresh in their mind, the Rossoneri stayed compact for the next seven minutes, until a corner which Dirk Kaut headed past Dida's reach in the 89th minute. A feeling of here we go again flooded the minds of the Milanistas, who had to just hold on for another few minutes, and they did. The Rossoneri were the 2007 champions of Europe, avenging their Turkish nightmare and declaring the Ancelotti era Milan one of the greatest European teams. They had lifted every trophy available to them including a Scudetto and two Champions Leagues, while also having an outrageous world-class squad at the disposal of an elite level manager, who helped develop talented players into icons of the sport. Though perhaps not comparable to the success of the Milan team in the late 80s and early 90s, 2003-07 has gone down as one of the most fruitful spells in Rossonero history. <laughs>